Welcome back everyone to the Board of Curators meeting. We'll continue with our agenda for this afternoon. Again, as a reminder, please mute your devices when you are not speaking. I'm now pleased to turn the podium over to President Choi to learn more about the highlights from MU. President Choi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you Chair Chapman. If I can have the presentation up, please. All right, uh, next slide. So I want to begin by sharing some highlights from our students, faculty, and alums. In uh, section number one, we see Colin Higgins, who is a, a junior studying sports management and a wheelchair basketball star who was recruited to Mizzou from Canada. And in the summer, he participated in the Tokyo Paralympic Games alongside our legendary coach, Ron Likens. In slide number two, uh, we have a student named Begin Horchanova, who is a junior. Can you go? Yes, who is a junior uh, studying business, and she ranked number two during the national women's chess competition. And the support from the Singfield family to start this chess program at Mizzou has been tremendous in attracting excellent students who are chess masters uh, applying their craft here at the, in the state of Missouri. And then section number three, we have one of our most distinguished faculty in Dr. Randall Prather, who together with his colleagues has created arguably the best genomics for swines in the United States and most likely in the world. And as part of this work, back in the early 2000s, he and his colleagues developed a special approach to create a knockout pig that can grow organs that would be less likely rejected by humans during a transplant. What well, took 20 years, but uh, uh, researchers and surgeons at NYU performed the first pig kidney to human transplant in October of 2021. And just in January of this year, researchers at the University of Maryland were able to transplant a pig, pig's heart into a human that this is only made possible by the work that was done here at Mizzou is truly comforting to know, given that there are approximately 100,000 patients in the United States waiting for organ transplant. On uh, section number four, we have Professor Marsha Chatelaine, who is a faculty a professor at uh, Georgetown University in the Department of History. And she received the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in History for her book, Franchise. And she uh, shared with us that if it hadn't been for the outstanding mentors at Mizzou that opened their eyes and opportunities to pursue her PhD at Brown University, she may have never thought about being a faculty member. So the overall contributions of our faculty and and planting the seeds of excellence so that they can go on, so that our students can go on and create their own uh, legacy in academia is truly, truly exciting. Next slide. Next slide. I wanna share with you when it comes to student success that the graduation rate is a very important metric. And as you can see, for the comparison between 2015 through 2020 or 2021, as indicated in this chart, for all students, Pell students, African-American students, and Hispanic Latinx students, we've hit a record high during the past two years. And this is despite the pandemic. And earlier, we talked about the importance of supporting those students from the lower socioeconomic classes. And they're measured in that category of Pell students. And we've had the highest increase that we've seen in our history. And you could also see the gap or the disparity between all students and Pell, African-American and Hispanic Latinx students reducing. Our goal is to increase the overall graduation rate as well as those categories that you see there and to reduce that disparity going forward. And that is a commitment that I know is shared from the board all the way down to our faculty and staff. Next slide. Now, why are students choosing 
to come to Mizzou and to our other three public research universities. It's because of the rich experiences that we provide. And as you can see from the uh, bullet points that are on the left, our quality, quality of our students as measured by their GPA, class standing, and ACT scores has been rising and rising significantly. And one of the big factors that they choose our university is that they are going to be successful. There's a track record of placing our students into jobs and also professional graduate studies after they graduate. That 95% rate is the highest in the state of Missouri for public universities. And as you can see from the last bullet, students are coming back to Mizzou. And we've seen a 23% increase in first-time college students over the past five years, and also a similar increase in transfer students. And some examples of the rich experiences that students have, they range from Rebecca Shu, who participates in computer science and health informatics research that received the Goldwater Scholarship, to Brandon Lee, another student in chemical engineering that has received the Goldwater Scholarship. And this is made possible because our students are able to perform research with our top faculty members who believe in training the next generation of researchers that work in academia, government, and in industry. Next slide. And for our graduate students, we have currently seven new NSF graduate research fellowship program fellows. This is the most important and most prestigious graduate fellowship for students in the United States. Only 2,000 students are selected each year. And as you can see, uh, next to the photos are the names and the field of study and the PhD institutions that our students will be performing uh, their research and continuing their education towards the doctorate. Now, I am happy about having seven outstanding students be recognized in this manner but I believe we can do much better. And uh, there is a, a new program that brings together all of the various offices uh, that report to the provost office so that we can charge that group, provide them the resources, support more applications. Over the next five years, I would like to see us typically getting around 30 to 35 of these fellows each and every year. And that's because our students are that good but they need support in helping write the proposals and to prepare their path for this important fellowship. Next slide. Recently, we, uh, we made the announcements to the PIs of 51 projects that would support student success. And these projects can run up to $100,000 with the additional amount that comes from cost sharing. And we're supporting a wide range of projects at almost every single college and school in the, at Mizzou, including, including our work that we do in extension. So some of these projects range from uh, training robots to do very important uh, rescue missions, as well as developing 3D surgical models that our biomedical and medical students can use to practice surgery as well as important extension projects to train law enforcement and firefighters using the latest virtual reality instrumentation. In all of these projects, we want to ensure that we have the latest innovations, instruments, and software to train our students to be competitive in the marketplace. Next slide. Next slide. I want to share with you the expenditure data that is most important for AAU institutions. One is phase one, uh, which is primarily competitive federal research projects. And phase two includes primarily state, industry, parts of USDA funding, as well as foundation accounts. And over the past uh, five years that are shown here on these charts, there have been a significant increase in expenditures on a per faculty basis, 40% for phase one and 86% for phase two. The future does look bright because our faculty members are actively collaborating and submitting proposals that are, that are 
considered to be nationally competitive. The next slide shows the leading indicator of research awards of both phase one and phase two. And because these are leading indicators, we believe that the expenditures are also gonna grow uh, in similar fashion over the next uh, few years. And look at the phase one, it's 72% increase. And phase two, it's 81% increase compared to 2016. Next slide. The other leading indicator is proposals. We have to write the proposal so that we can be in consideration to receive the awards, to be able to conduct the project and have expenditure. So once again, our leading indicator of proposals has increased dramatically at 84% for phase one and 105% for phase two. Next slide. And it's very important that when we uh, ask our faculty members to submit more proposals that are competitive to provide the resources. And a key investment was made in October 19, 2021, when we had the groundbreaking, I'm sorry, groundbreaking, grand opening of Next Gen Precision Health Building with uh, participation from members of our board, as well as Francis Collins of NIH and Senator Blunt, uh, who was so instrumental in securing important funds for this, as well as nationwide NIH and Pell project funds. And this is the first of many investments that we're gonna be making as part of Mizzou Forward. And I'll have more to share during the State of the Union address on March 15th. Next slide. The reason that investments like this are so important, please click through the slides so we have all of the information up on the screen is that key investments that are made now can reap dividends in the future. Back in the 60s, the president and the board of curators made a critical decision to invest in nuclear research reactor. Now, at the time, I don't know if they realized it, but what that has created is a really unique set of uh, capabilities at our university that cannot be matched at any other university in the United States. In fact, as part of this effort for research as well as production of isotopes, we create more radioisotope doses than the entire US Department of Energy. And as you can see in that uh, table below, we ship out, we create using our own technologies and ship out almost 15,000 doses of radioisotopes that are used for cancer as well as. Uh, as well as other types of diseases. And so that means that if we stopped operation of our nuclear research reactor, 15,000 people in the United States and the Western Hemisphere would not get the life-saving treatment that is made possible by the work that we do. So in the same way, next-gen precision health building is that type of investment, but we need to continue. Next slide. But more importantly than buildings, buildings and instrument is the investment in people. And recently we learned that three of our faculty members have received the very prestigious AAAS fellow status that, that identifies and, and recognizes top scientists in their field. And that is Professor Leanne Allen from Microbiology Immunology Department at School of Medicine. Dr. Susan Reno, who is a faculty member in the School of Journalism, as well as Associate Vice Chancellor in the Office of Research, and Dr. Cheryl Rosenfeld. She's in the Biomedical Sciences Department in the College of Veterinary Medicine. And we're so proud that these three individuals are joining a group of about two dozen at our university that are recognized for their outstanding contributions for advancing science for advancing science that can have a broader impact to our society. Next slide. And uh, we have many more faculty members that uh, are deserving of these types of awards and not only from our own current faculty ranks, but we're also hiring the very best. And I just wanna give you a chance to just browse through the initial hires that have been made as part of Mizzou Forward. 
innovative uh, faculty hiring program in the School of Medicine. And uh, it is part of the Mizzou Forward framework. And uh, as you can see, the faculty members that we're hiring are coming from top institutions from around the country. And they're attracted because of the excitement built around NextGen and the many other research thrusts that we have at the university. Next slide, please. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize presidential fellows at Mizzou, and they are Kelly Canada, Glenn T for Intercampus Collaboration, Ashley Givens, as well as Clark Peters for Intercampus Collaboration, and Dr. Glenn Cameron from, uh, he has done some extraordinary work and is being recognized with the Thomas Jefferson Award. And other faculty members include Brett Johnson for Early Career, Excellence in Teaching and Research, and Zhang Yang for Early Career uh, Distinction in Research and Teaching the STEM Discipline. Professor Ron Kelly from the School of Journalism has been recognized for the Community Engagement Award. And Dr. Wayne, Wendy Reinke has, uh, has really created a world-class center at the University of Missouri that looks at innovative approaches to improve education and she is from the College of Education. Next slide. Lastly, I wanna thank uh, Vice Chancellor Gary Ward for 17 years of outstanding services to Mizzou. He has uh, led many different groups at the university that ranges from our television station, KOMU, to University Concert Series to Dining Services. And he'll be greatly missed and he leaves behind a terrific legacy of service to the institution. And uh, we wish him very well uh, for his next endeavor and uh, want to thank him for his 17 years of service at Missouri. So with that, uh, Curator Chapman, I am, I've completed my presentation and would be pleased to take any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Choi. This is great work and, and thank you for all, for your leadership through all of this. Um, any questions for Dr. Choi? Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Choi. And um, I'm pleased to turn the meeting over to Stephen Chafin to introduce our strategic theme discussion for today related to student success. Stephen, you ready? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think we have some slides that'll be coming up. Okay, if you can go to the next slide. All right, well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. So for today's strategic theme discussion on student success, each university has identified actionable, leading and lagging indicators associated with student success. And the goal of the presentation is to provide the board with a dashboard on student success that can be reviewed on an annual basis. I do wanna go ahead and thank the provosts and vice provosts for all of their hard work on this presentation, as well as for Curator Hobrock for all of his guidance uh, and vision for this presentation. Um, leading indicators are those that indicate whether or not we're on the right track. So those are things like first year retention rates, as well as student engagement with academic support services. Lagging indicators are those that indicate whether we've ultimately been successful in our student success endeavors, things like graduation rates, as well as job placement rates. For each indicator, the universities will identify past and present values, as well as strategic goals they're working to achieve. They'll also highlight uh, initiatives and investments they've either already made or are planning to make to further these goals. Before we begin, I do wanna make a few additional points. First, many of the goals that you review today are derived from our strategic plans, which run through 2023. So as needed, as new goals are developed, we will provide updated goals to the board as they're developed. Uh, additionally, while some of the indicators we highlight today are some of the most important to our universities, they're far from the only things that we measure. Additionally, there are other indicators, things like a student's sense of belonging at our universities that are very important to our ability to be successful, but are much more difficult to quantify. And so that's important context as we go through the presentations. 
Um, additionally, I wanted to point out that each university engaged in this exercise independently. And this was done intentionally to recognize the unique missions, strengths, and growth opportunities for each of our four unique universities. Uh, fourth, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a comparison of some of the most uh, important indicators of student success, uh, first year retention, four year and six year graduation rates. And this goes across uh, Missouri public four year institutions, excluding the UM system, that's the red bar on the left, the UM system, as well as public four year institutions nationally. And as you can see on all three of these important metrics, the UM system fares quite well, uh, exceeding the other two groups on all three of these measures. Uh, but of course, there's always more work to be done to meet our own goals. And that's the purpose of today's presentation. Um, and lastly, um, we would ask that to the extent possible, um, we hold questions until the end. And the purpose of that is just to give each campus an equal opportunity to walk through their indicators and their highlights. Um, so with that, if you could go to the next slide, I'm happy to turn it over to Beth Eckelkamp, the Vice Provost for Student Success and Academic Innovation at UMSL, and she'll get us started. Thank you. I've been added as a presenter, so um, I would like to uh, begin if that's all right. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity today to, um, to speak with you. I'm really um, thankful to the members of the Board of Curators for really caring so uh, deeply about the student academic experience and the resulting outcomes of the time that they spend at our universities, especially grateful to Curator Hobrock for the time he spent uh, with us in framing the questions that drive our discussions today and to Stephen Chafin for working with us and pulling together a presentation that we believe really will help us um, provide some insight to our shared passion for our students along with very campus specific focus areas and strategies. Um, I do have the distinct privilege of representing UMSL today alongside my stellar colleagues from across the system and while we're each committed to the needs of our own campuses, please allow me to note that we're always delighted to be able to share ideas and support each other in the important work that our campus teams do in the student success arena. Um, so next slide, please. Our UMSL student success story is framed and driven in a myriad of measures, but inevitably what drives us um, all to moving students down the uh, path to graduation is the most important. And you can, you will see that all four campuses will speak to their graduation rates at it, as it is um, the penultimate measure of the success of our students. Um, the focus will vary, however, as it's a dynamic, uh, very dynamic measure. On this first slide that features two lagging indicators tied to graduation rates for us, you can see that in 2018, we set a very ambitious five-year strategic goal um, of graduating 65% of our entering students within the six-year window, which would put us solidly at the top of our urban land grant metropolitan comparator institutions. Uh, parenthetically, we use the combined uh, graduation rate at UMSL rather than focusing only on first-time freshmen or FTC um, because 75% of our students fall into that transfer or TRE category. Uh, moving this metric by a percentage point year over year for five consecutive years was actually quite a stretch goal. But as you can see from this table, we actually exceeded uh, the goal by two percentage points this past year, a really Herculean effort um, that required every member of our campus team uh, to be focused on transforming the lives of our students. However, as long as there's a measurable completion gap for any students on our campus, our goals are not fully met. So we strive to close that gap for our underrepresented student groups, as you can see um, in that second lagging indicator. Next slide, please. My system colleagues will also point to the first year retention rate as a key lagging indicator, as this retention rate remains the single best predictor of graduation rates. Again, at UMSL, we look at this metric as a combined metric of um, a first-time freshman in transfers. We um, sadly experienced a dip in this measure this past year, working hard to identify the challenges to slow any ensuing slide from that dip. Uh, successful career outcomes are, of course, the goalposts for all of our campuses and the real source for the transformational effect of a college education at UMSL for a student population that skews heavily to first-generation and limited income. This metric is again driven by our strategic goals for 2023 and the heavy lifting that has gone into meeting and exceeding that goal has been significant. Next slide, please. This infographic from our career services office also highlights a commitment that we have 
to provide an educated workforce for the region. Um, and as you can see, 89% uh, of our graduates are employed in Missouri. Next slide, please. We track progress in many ways, and the leading indicators include credit, things like credit hour accumulation, benchmark course completion, major declaration timeline, among others. But today, we'd like to highlight two of the progress indicators that are important uh, to us in reaching our lagging indicator six-year graduation rate goal. While nationally, we refer to retention rates to measure year one to year two returners, we track persistence rates to follow students as they move through the ensuing years. Um, and then for a primarily transfer institution, it's also extremely important to track our third, fourth, and fifth year graduation rates for overall and URM populations. Um, with the number of part-time and returning students that tend to swirl in and out as um, they work full-time jobs and raise families, this tracking measure can be really complicated and challenging, but it's definitely a key indicator that helps us stay on track to meet our strategic goals. Um, next slide, please. In order to ensure that our students move through the most challenging courses, the courses most likely um, to create roadblocks per se, we have um, invested in academic supports that are embedded directly in those very courses. These um, supports that, uh, rely uniquely on peer mentorship and based on success of the various programs that we have expanded, fun uh, uh, we have expanded funding for these supports. And over the past six years and plan to continue to invest in increasing those supports in the future. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. And then directly relevant to our lagging indicator of postgraduate career outcomes is our leading indicator of the percentage of new freshmen uh, that take part in a very intentionally designed early introduction to an interest inventory and one-on-one -on -one engagement with career services. Next slide, please. Um, the innovation and interventions and initiatives to impact student success are also myriad, um, but I'd like to focus uh, for a few minutes on four of the interventions that we feel have been exceptionally high impact. In 2018, we began an ambitious curriculum alignment process as a partnership between academic affairs and our Center for Teaching and Learning. The very core of our student experience, the academic curriculum itself, was too often proving um, to create unintended roadblocks um, to completion or causing students to take extra credits to graduate. Um, so spearheaded by Dr. Keita Holmes, this initiative ensures that each program has clearly articulated learning outcomes with courses mapped to those outcomes. And as a result, we've been able to focus on decreasing time to graduation, minimizing excess hours at graduation and such that might've been caused by extending time at the university. Additional outcomes that have proven to be highly beneficial to students have been faculty learning communities focused on shared challenges in areas like first year writing and statistics, as well as really focusing on creating a sense of belonging in the classroom for all students through faculty development. This is a key tactic in impacting completion gaps for underrepresented students. And then along uh, with the Foundations for Success um, created by a focus on excellence in academic advising across campus, Comprehensive academic supports, including coaching and tutoring, have also been key to meeting our goals and to closing those completion gaps. Additionally, our supplemental instructor program places students who were highly successful in a given challenging course in a preceding semester uh, back into that course as a support uh, to work with fellow students on success strategies and transferable skills uh, that can build individual student toolboxes um, for academic growth and achievement. Dr. Jenna Alexander modeled our SI program off the internationally acclaimed SI program started by UMKC. We're grateful for our sister campus's leadership uh, in this area. Our active learning assistant program, also out of the Center for Teaching and Learning, places students in courses in which they've been successful, but more as a faculty development tool uh, for faculty who uh, seek to incorporate um, active learning experiences into classrooms, uh, relying on this peer support to reach and engage um, students more intentionally inside of the classroom. And in 2018, Dr. Natisha Small led our university tutoring center um, to um, in our, house in our student academic support services area to launch a student success grant funded tutoring program that provided course specific tutors that work again in partnership with faculty in these specially challenging courses as well. So embedded support such as SI and ALA and student success grant funded tutors have been a key initiative that have driven our metrics for success and ones that we hope to continue to support. Uh, next slide, please. 
<clears throat> this slide just gives a snapshot of that soup to nuts approach undertaken by the student academic support services led by Dr. Small, beginning with access programming and moving through the academic journey to the workforce. In addition to the embedded tutors that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Small and her team received a Lumina grant um, in partnership with St. Louis graduates that provided the ability to expand additionally needed uh, tutoring supports, a uh, targeting underrepresented students um, initiative that really directly again focused on impacting our completion gaps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide just gives a quick look at the impact that a program like uh, SI can have on the GPA of students who are enrolled in an SI supported course. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the last two initiatives that I would like to focus on are uh, first around the intentional engagement with career services. Again, starting with that first year experience course that I mentioned earlier, and then continuing with the NACE or National Association of Colleges and Employers key competencies. Um, really, we find that assisting students in giving a voice to the competencies they've gained during their college experience is really key to their securing meaningful um, postgraduate experiences in the world of work. Um, and so this has become a focus of the work um, with students at all levels and uh, Career Services Director, Teresa Balistre, really leads a, this really highly student-focused team um, for whom this direct student engagement is really the center of their work and has driven their success. Uh, lastly, an investment in the Starfish Predictive Analytics Platform has provided us with expanded opportunities to make some really data-driven decisions about where we place our resources, how we design our interventions, and uh, what kinds of initiatives uh, we can support. Uh, for instance, velocity scores that track a student's percentage of uh, successful course completion and on-track path to graduation um, is one example of the output of this kind of analytics program. And it really provides extremely informative snapshots for our advisors and our coaches, department chairs, faculty members alike as they really strive to support and motivate our students. Uh, while these measures and initiatives are by no means a comprehensive list, I hope they have given a snapshot of the challenges that we face, um, the work that we have cut out for us, the high level of commitment that we have to meeting our students' success goals. We're so proud of our social mobility impacts and our role as an economic driver in our region, but we literally will not rest until all of our students are successful. Next slide. So I'd like to pass the microphone, the virtual microphone now to Dr. Christy Holsinger, a valued colleague and uh, Senior Vice President, uh, Vice Provost for Student Success at UMKC. Thank you, Beth. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My position in the Division of Student Success was established about two years ago by our Chancellor, representing a strong commitment to and investment in improving the success of our students. As a result, we've implemented many new initiatives. It is both a privilege and a significant responsibility to be in this role and a real honor to be sharing some of this work with the Board of Curators today. With great appreciation to Cur Curator Hoberach, Stephen Chafin, and my colleagues, and thanks for the great conversations we've had um, in preparing for this, um, this time together. Let Next slide, please. Lagging indicators allow us to look at our past performance and evaluate if we are achieving our intended outcomes. They also allow for future goal setting. We look at our freshman retention rate as a middle or more immediate indicator, which impacts our more long range indicators like graduation rates and career outcomes. And a recent national study found that certain institutional and student characteristics are predictive of that school's retention and graduation outcomes. So here are the four factors they found to be correlated with lower rates, having higher percentages of students who are part-time, higher percentage of students receiving federal funds, lower rates of students living on campus, and lower levels of selectivity of the institution. Our data reflect those patterns, but we are convinced we can use this information to improve these rates. And let me give you a specific example. We know that part-time students and students who need to work full-time while in school are least likely to participate in applied learning experiences. So we're developing opportunities that work better for those students. As you'll see from our new initiatives, particularly the professional mobility escalators, we're putting a great deal of focus on career readiness and connecting students to jobs. 
When I think about student success, a big part of that work is providing life transforming experiences for our students and their families, all while filling in demand occupations for the region. Beyond tracking our outcomes for historically underrepresented students, we pay close attention to outcomes for students who are first generation and Pell eligible and are working hard to close those gaps. The asterisk on this slide notes that we have validity issues with the career outcomes data collected in our exit survey and have lacked appropriate follow-up. So we're excited to be implementing a new system of data collection with this May's graduating class called 1220, which will greatly improve the accuracy and reliability of this data. Additionally, career services staff will begin doing outreach up to six months post-graduation, specifically to students who are still seeking employment or are underemployed. This will undoubtedly improve our career outcomes. Chancellor Agrawal developed our final lagging indicator, which is an interesting measure given some of those student characteristics I just mentioned, a graduation index, which shows the production of graduates for the workforce. Next slide, please. Nearly half of our undergrads are transfer students, and this metric includes them. We also know that many of our first time college students work full time and or have caretaking responsibilities. And like me and my siblings, occasionally need to take a semester off or drop down to part time to earn money for tuition. If all students neatly graduated within four years, we would be graduating 25% of our students each year. This data shows that we are currently achieving this goal, that we're pushing our students to declare a major early, take 15 credit hours a semester and graduate in four years. I was also curious what this number would look like if we included the 13% of our students who are part-time. And um, that only drops the percentage down to 22. So both numbers speak well to UMKC's performance. Next slide, please. Leading indicators allow us to look forward to future outcomes, or more specifically, these are the actions we expect to lead to better outcomes in our lagging indicators. There are many ways we measure what's happening in academic advising, career services, academic and non-academic supports, and you'll see others on the following slide. But here I'm just providing one measure of each, and these are indicators we're expecting to have a significant Im impact. So student success is about being high tech and high touch with high levels of individualized outreach. And our new model of academic advising has implemented many new practices, including initial getting to know you appointments for new students and surveys for all students designed specifically to learn what problems or barriers they are experiencing so that they can be referred to existing services. So this could be everything from wanting to be more involved in campus life and making friends to the need for mental health counseling. As noted, student success is about preparing students for careers. And one of the best ways to do that is through applied learning experiences, which took a small but not surprising dip with the pandemic. Again, this is not a great measure for us because these numbers cannot be calculated as a percentage because students could choose multiple experiences. But our goal, which will be tracked better with the implementation of 1220, is that 60% of our students would have such an experience by 2025. Um, next slide, please. Student success is also about increasing the visibility and accessibility of academic supports. And we're currently piloting a new, less expensive model of delivering supplemental instruction, which will allow us to support more classes. We are also planning a fundamental skills course for current students who are on academic probation because of their GPA. So if successful, this could be a new strategy for supporting and retaining those students who are less likely to persist. Student success is also about holistically addressing non-academic factors that impede success, and there are many. As you can see from the numbers, our new Financial Wellness Center hit the ground running after conducting a campus-wide assessment and developing a strategic plan. The numbers are coming in part from engagement with students in the first year experience class. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to provide some additional details on the new initiatives I've referenced so far. Career Services is under new leadership with plans for reimagining and expanding student services. 
They are already collaborating with RU Advising and the first semester experience to increase awareness of and engagement with their services. They're also instrumental in the development of the core components of the Professional Mobility Escalators Program, which our Chancellor shared about at the last Board of Curators meeting and is also outlined in this slide. So a quick update on the PME program, which is really taking shape, includes the development of our PME Living Learning Community. The application for our first cohort is live and students will know by April 1 if they've been accepted into the program. This summer, we're going to hold an employer symposium to help prepare our community partners for providing mentoring and applied learning experiences to these students. So we are very excited about the launch of this program. Uh, next slide. Here are two additional initiatives that I'm optimistic will impact student success outcomes. Uh, the new RU advising model, which I mentioned, has corrected and standardized advisor to student ratios for increased data-driven outreach of many different types. Um, their work around developing student learning outcomes that include embedded career milestones is innovative. And as you will also see on this slide, some additional components of our new financial wellness center. The collaboration happening between these two units is a good example of a trend toward increasing collaborations across camp with campus, which you've likely noticed in this presentation. Um, next slide. So RU Advising administers a belonging survey to our students. At week seven last semester, 32% of our students said they would like help managing their finances. These students were contacted twice about the resources in the Financial Wellness Center, and 25% of those contacted actually set up and attended and attended a one on one coaching session. As you can see, those numbers for week are, are here for week 12 as well 16% desired help, 46% followed through with a coaching appointment. In term withdrawal surveys, we see about 14% reporting they left due to financial issues, underscoring the importance of this resource. Uh, finally, I thought it'd be interesting to share the way our new centralized undergraduate academic advising model is structured. That's on the next slide, thanks. Um, in the yellow boxes, you can see that we've developed major academic pathways, and this was based on major change patterns, behavior patterns in our students. And these categories uh, are used in our general education program to assign students to courses. And we're finding that this same structure is working well for our new centralized model of academic advising. Um, I would just like to close by offering a word of appreciation to the dedicated people I work with, whether they are providing needed data or figuring out how to recruit students in unusual times or building, implementing, and assessing our various initiatives. I am lucky to be surrounded by people who take the success of our students so seriously. I, and now I will turn it over to Kathy Northcutt, Vice Provost for Academic Support at Missouri s &T. Thank you so much, Christy. It's such an honor to represent Missouri s and today to the Board of Curators. I also wanna thank Steve Chaffin for organizing our communications and our preparations. We can go to the next slide. For both our lagging and leading indicators, Missouri s and is going to isolate some uh, by now familiar themes. Six year graduation rates, re first year retention rates, we'll disaggregate those a bit and we're going to dive into diversity and career outcomes as well. Our graduation rates by percentage tend to be in the mid 60s, but some interventions underway should achieve the 70% that we anticipated in our strategic plan and um, will maintain or exceed those by our target date of 2027. When we look at our outcomes gaps, the completion gap that Beth Echelkamp referred to earlier, we know we have more work to do to keep more minority identifying students and Paul recipients in the STEM pipeline. Retention rates have leveled off in the past couple of years, uh, both of which saw about 85%. That was the goal in our strategic plan. So our new longer term goal is 90%. We anticipate that we may continue to see lags in minority identifying student success and Paul recipients, but we're working on improving outcomes for them as well. We'd like to see those rates level off and the goal for those cohorts is 85% by 2027. 
So if we go to the next slide, we'll see the same retention information in graphic form with the specific cohorts and solid green compared to the overall undergraduate population um, and the success of the, the mean success in the black line. You'll see that our overall retention trends up, but the underrepresented uh, population retention varies more, partly because of the small number of students in each cohort. On the right side, the Pell recipients track more steadily with the undergraduate population, but Pell recipients are still about five points behind the average for retention and, by the way, graduation. We do have an uptick this year. When we report on the 21-22 academic year, this downward trend that you see in those bars representing the overall undergraduate population will stop going down. They're going back up. We have um, more than 100 new first-time students in our first-year cohort this year. So that'll be a positive shift that will then drive larger undergraduate enrollments in the future. On the next slide, you'll see, um, we, we know that achieving compositional diversity can be a challenge for STEM-focused institutions and for rural institutions, and we are both. The metric we're focusing on right now is the percentage of underrepresented minority students, and you'll see that we've provided those, those percentages for the whole population and for that full-time, first-time entering student cohort. These are aggregated. The URM aggregates Hispanic, Black, African American, multiracial um, American Indian, and Pacific Islander populations. And you'll see that our goal is to reach 15% among the first year cohort by 2027. And as those first year cohorts are more diverse, that will improve on the diversity percentage for our overall undergraduate population. Finally, all of our career outcomes demonstrate our level of success in fulfilling the promise of a job after college. The return rate on surveys just helps us ensure that the job placement data and the salary data that we collect is truly representational. A 90% return rate is the goal for 2023, and that was just pegged to our strategic plan. So on the next slide, You'll see we're just getting back to the percentages of underrepresented minority identifying students against the entire graduate undergraduate population. And those underrepresented minority percentages hold steady as our undergraduate population decline. But of course, we wanna see everything trending upward and we have plans to do so. Now on the next slide for our leading indicators, we know that graduation rates should rise if students progress faster with fewer barriers. And one of the ways to improve time to degree for students is to increase the number of credit hours per semester. And through a variety of, of efforts, small and large, our goal is to increase that number that's held steady at 14.3 to 15.5 by 2027. We also know, as you've, as you've already heard, a key to retention is high quality advising. We've tracked our advising appointments and we've seen really good increases in, in the past few cycles from over 3,000 to over 8,000. And we hope to um, achieve some high targets for five years out. That, that target will reflect more participation from faculty advisors and staff advisors and also with students. We'd like to see almost all students advising appointments recorded in Starfish by 2027. 100% of the students will be advised, but Starfish gives us more visibility and more sharing of the information about the advising. And so we're hoping that virtually all of those advising point appointments are traceable through Starfish. On the next slide, diversity is relatively easy to measure by just counting students, but a more important goal that y'all spoke about this morning, in fact, is that truly inclusive campus climate where people can be welcomed and productive regardless of identity. The Pride Index is just one way to nationally benchmark this. Our recent data for the Pride Index show us at three out of five stars as an aggregated index score across eight categories. And our Student Diversity Initiatives Office 
plans to improve to a four-star rating in the next five years. Our career outcomes as a STEM institution tend to be strong. The large percentage of students who interact with career opportunities and employer relations leads to high participation in the survey that I mentioned earlier in our lagging indicators. And therefore we have high confidence that when we say we outpace national averages for starting salaries, that's truly a result of an s and education. It's not a statistical anomaly. We plan to continue to outpace national averages for starting salaries into the future. We also, it's not on the slide, but um, just a related category people always talk about is those career outcomes. And we uh, hope to and plan to achieve 95% of positive career placement by 2023. And if so, it sounds like we'll be tied with um, Mizzou according to President Choi's statistics he presented a few minutes ago. On the next slide, I've just, I've just given you a couple of brief snapshots about the many things we're monitoring and the hundreds of efforts that are underway. You may be already familiar with our campus's North Star goals, which will ultimately um, hold a population of 12,000 students, 8,000 of them being undergraduates. We have identified academic advising as a key to retention and ultimately a contributor to higher graduation rates, we've invested very recently, currently happening in advisors and hardware and software. And our centralized advising office is under new management. They've already identified plans for more effective outreach and communications. We are improving our campus climate to have an even more diverse community. And finally, we've achieved impressive career outcomes and our continued focus efforts will ensure that we build on that success. We do have a career fair coming up this month and it will happen both virtually and in person. And my understanding is that a record number of employers have subscribed to that event already. This brings me to the end of my time. And so with the next slide, I am pleased to introduce our next and final speaker, Dr. Jim Spain of Mizzou. Thank you, Kathy, and thanks to my colleagues for the great opportunity to collaborate and um, appreciate the support that Stephen has provided and for the framework that Curator Hobrock provided for the presentation. And if we'll go to the next slide, you're going to hear a very familiar theme. Um, our lagging indicators, which were established in our strategic plan for student success, include freshman retention rate, four-year graduation rate, six-year graduation rate, and successful career outcomes rate. They were established as our, our target goals or our priority goals and our student success strategic plan because these are the, these are the outcomes our students and their families value the most. These are the outcomes that they expect us to help their students achieve. So that obviously they would become our priorities. In addition, um, these metrics are also um, important in the state's performance funding metrics and also contribute to our ability to represent Mizzou's success in, in national and international rankings and comparison. So our freshman retention rate, um, we had a strong retention rate where we've moved it in the right direction. Our goal for 2025 has been established at 91%. That would place Mizzou as one of, of about 100 um, universities, public and private nationwide, that have a 90% or higher freshman retention rate. Our four-year graduation rate is is probably the place that we've been able to move the needle the most, so to speak. Um, when we started, uh, when we established our strategic plan, we were at 46%. Our goal for 2023 was 55%. And this past year, we surpassed our goal reaching 56.4%. So we've adjusted a goal going forward to 60% by 2025. Similarly, our six-year graduation rate has improved to 72.5. Um, we are just short of our goal. I, I'm confident we'll meet our goal by next year and, and have established an, a new five-year 
a goal at 76% by 2025. And then the successful career outcomes rate, this is a, an emphasis or priority area for us at Mizzou. Um, our goal was 95%. We've achieved our goal a year in advance. Our most recent um, measurement of career outcomes rate is available at, at our career outcomes site on, on the webpage. And it's a, available for your review. And we have five years worth of data there. Um, highlights of our, our most recent success. Um, we have our students went to work for over 1,500 unique companies, 104 Fortune 500 companies. Our, our graduates um, are in 45 different states, and our top employers, full time employment MU Healthcare, KPMG, Cerner, Veterans United, um, PwC, Ernst and Young. AT&T, Deloitte, and SSM Health. So our students are moving into the finance and healthcare, which are the two largest kind of academic degree areas for our campus. And, um, and, and our students are being very successful in, in achieving um, positive career outcomes based on their, their academic degrees, but also their overall Mizzou experience. Next slide, please. So Curator Hobrock asked um, that we establish leading indicators, that if we move these indicators, they will have a positive impact on the lagging indicators. So our analysis has, has focused really on what are those metrics that we can measure that by being able to measure, we can track our success rates in changing them over time. And so we're focused on um, velocity to degree, student credit hours earned after their first semester and, and first year. Um, as you can see here, we have a very small percentage of our students who are earning more than 15 credit hours in their first semester or more than 30 credit hours at the end of their first year. And we know that students who finish with fewer than 28 credit hours have less than a 70% um, likelihood of graduating on time. And so if we want to increase four and six year graduation rates, we have to increase the number of students who are completing adequate numbers of credit hours, um, in, especially in their first two years as identified in these leading indicators of, of student credit hours earned in the first and student credit hours earned in the second. And we have a target of, of achieving at least, at least 75% of our students um, reaching 15 and 30 credit hours completed, earned at Mizzou by the end of their first semester and first year. And more than 75% of our students earning more than 60 credit hours by the end of their second year. Next slide. In addition, we know that the number one reason students leave Mizzou, the number one reason students leave higher education is financial. And we track our, our metric for tracking that are the number of students who have a past due financial hold that impacts their enrollment. So if a student has a past due balance, um, that's 90 days past due, we place an enrollment hold so the students can persist. Um, so um, as an example, we know that we have 673 students who are here at Mizzou in the fall who haven't enrolled for the spring semester. And 23% of those students have a past due hold. And so we, we know that by addressing um, the financial wellness of our students and their ability to, to meet the financial obligation of being a student at Mizzou, that we will also then have a positive impact on four and six year graduation rates. Um, academic success. Um, Mizzou has a, a unique academic portfolio in that a number of our academic programs require a secondary admission. So you're admitted to Mizzou, but you have to perform at a certain level as a Mizzou student to be then admitted 
subsequently to a program in, for example, engineering or the College of Business, the Sinclair School of Nursing, the College of Education. And so our analysis shows that, that students that have less than or equal to a 2.7 GPA at the end of their second, at the end of their third year at Mizzou are less likely to persist to a four or six year graduation rate. So we're going to make an effort to improve the academic success of our students. A lot of levers that we can pull there that impact that, which makes this work a, a bit more complicated and complex, but we're focusing in on areas that we think will be the, the highest impact areas through some strategic investments um, that Dr. Choi and Dr. Ramshan are um, championing here at Mizzou. So next, on my next slide then, I'll share with you where those initiatives are. Um, academic advising, you've heard, uh, we're planning to move forward in hiring 15 to 16 additional academic advisors, which will allow us to reduce our academic advising caseload to 350 students per advisor. Um, we are also in the final stages of recruiting and hiring a new position of the Director of Academic Advising Initiatives. And this person will be responsible for supporting our academic advisors across campus, providing appropriate training, um, really enhancing and, and expanding our professional development because we know that we have a retention challenge with academic advisors and we want to provide them with the support and a career path that um, helps us retain those academic advisors so students aren't experiencing a different academic advisor um, across their time at Mizzou. In addition, you've heard about early alert. Uh, our current early alert adoption rate is speaks to our faculty's commitment to student success. 65% of all of our undergraduate courses at Mizzou are currently using our early alert system, which is the Starfish platform branded here at MU as MU Connect. And almost 85% of all of our 1000 level courses. And so with ac expanded academic advising capacity and continued to um, facilitate and support early alert. What's early alert? Early alert means that a student um, fails their first exam. I can raise a flag in the system to alert an academic advisor, to alert the, the learning center that this student is struggling so that we can intervene before the student gets to the end of the semester and, and um, is, has, has not done well enough to academically progress in a course. Um, and our, our degree completion effort, efforts and focus, um, Mizzou is a, has currently, we have an RFP out for degree um, planner and scheduler. Um, this not only will allow us to, to track how many credit hours a student is earning, but to track are those credit hours relevant to the degree that they're trying to achieve. And by doing this, we'll be able to track and, and identify students who are off program, off track, so our academic advisors can, can reach out and connect with those students. The other feature that we anticipate having, expect to have as part of this new platform is goes back to the student who isn't um, admitted into the secondary admission program that they expected to achieve. This program will allow the students to work with academic advisors to do some what if plan. So if I'm not gonna be in this major, what if I did this major or this major? How do the courses count? Um, and how did, what would it look like for me to finish um, my degree in a different program than what I anticipated? So again, a, a focus on academic um, progress to degree also important for our students to be able to maintain their scholarship support, especially their federally um, financed scholarships. Next slide, please. And because of, of this, um, the impact of financial wellness, um, our campus has centralized the Office of 
Office for Financial Success. It's a, a program that has was developed and established in our personal financial planning department. It's now uh, aligned with our Office of Financial Aid, and they will be providing programming, but also one-on-one -on -one student consultations on how to manage the financial resources they have available so that we can um, intervene earlier to prevent the financial hold that we know then leads to or is associated with the decreased um, likelihood of, of graduation. And then I know that um, the, the discussion about a, a plateau tuition, plateau tuition rather, um, we're excited about the potential impact this would have on student success. Um, this will provide a financial incentive for students to take the additional credit hours to reach the targets of 30, 60, 90 credit hours per academic year that is so highly and strongly correlated with students finishing um, their degree on time, um, helping them control their overall cost of their degree program and being prepared to enter into the, the workforce. So again, it's a, a very complex and complicated um, system of, uh, or, or factors or metrics, but we think we've identified the key metrics as the leading indicators. They're measurable. We'll be able to track them. And we think that we're gonna be able to impact them to positively impact our lagging indicators of graduation rates. So with that, um, that's my last slide, and I think um, we are prepared now to answer or try to answer the questions the, the board has. Thank okay. you. Thank you, everyone, for all that information. That was that was very informative, very well done, and Curator Holbrock, thank you for uh, working with everyone to get that done. Any questions from the board? Well, obviously, Daryl, I have few, I have a few. Okay. I think everybody um, um, uh, on, on, on your lagging indicators, I had everybody uh, centered around four year and six year and nobody picked time of completion. Again, everybody would I just give some some highlight here. Each school, each university was allowed to pick whatever they wanted. I, and I'm just surprised that somebody didn't pick uh, time of completion. But uh, that's neither here nor there. But here's the one thing I did see through the whole presentation that I, I challenge you to do. On your, how are you going to measure the effectiveness of your intervention steps to that leading indicator? How are you going to draw the correlation? Sure, um, uh, go ahead. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. So again, um, referencing back to um, the Starfish platform, um, we're able to to raise a flag, for example, in that system. We know how that flag is resolved, and then we can track the impact of that um, intervention on subsequent success of our student. So we do have a, a, a process to be able to, to track what we're doing with what students in response to what situation, and then what's the downstream impact of that on their, on their success. So it, it's, you're absolutely right. Being able to track the, the effectiveness of our interventions are key. And, um, and we're positioned and prepared to, to be able to do that. And, 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 and again, I, I think that's probably a, that's fabulous. And you'll find out that if it either works or it doesn't work and you can change what you need to do for your interventions later. Uh, my point with that is we need to be able to do that with every step of intervention we're going to take so that we know whether or not we can use data to, to, to decide or to establish or to rate, however you wanna, whatever word you wanna use to see whether the interventions we're doing are, are, are effective. And if the intervention we picked is not effective, we have, to, I think have to be quick to abandon it and look for another way to affect these outcomes that we want to have. And, and, and for me, what I'm interested in is watching this change over time. Um, you know, that we did this, this worked, this didn't. 
uh, Curator Horrock, we used the wrong leading indicators. Uh, we thought if we could affect this one, it didn't move the needle. We're sorry, we, we need to pick another one. That's the flexibility I want to see in it. And I think we can fine tune this to the point that we can really improve student out outcomes down the road, which is what I'm after. But we have to start with a baseline somewhere. So think about that interconnection between any intervention I want to pick, what am I trying to affect, and how do I measure the interve intervention to the effect to that leading indicator to predict the lagging indicator? Could I just uh, comment? Thank you very much for that question, Curator Hobrock. And um, you know, thinking about uh, time to completion, definitely, I think every single one of our campuses has an eye on that as well. And um, our curriculum alignment process really used that as the, as the primary indicator. Um, I think a little bit of a challenge is that um, sometimes we can't isolate um, initiatives uh, because we have two or three initiatives or a dozen that are focusing on that same outcome. Um, so, but I, I really appreciate that the focus on thinking about what we might need to stop doing because it hasn't been as effective in, in sort of changing course and, and investing in another initiative. Any further questions? Yeah, this is Jeff Lehman. Uh, Jim, you mentioned that uh, one of the main reasons uh, we lose students is, is cost. I'm a big believer in cost only matters in the absence of value. How, how can we, do you have any recommendations on how we can uh, make sure the students get a tremendous value uh, and that we don't, especially in, you know, we do have an inflationary environment. Um, do you have any, any, any thoughts on that? How, we, how we're able to keep that to where it's, it's affordable? Uh, well, Curator Lehman, that's a, first off, that's a very important question for us to focus on is affordability, right? Val value, affordability. And of course, one of the ways we try to demonstrate value to the students is our very high career outcomes rate and the kinds of opportunities that students have. Um, of, of value and how much a student and or their family is willing to invest is another way that we consider that. And I do know that in visiting with um, Emily uh, Hainham, who's the director of financial aid here, that our families are hesitant to take out some of the loans that they have available to them, that if they took those, they, if they were to take some loans out, and, and we're, we're not talking about an extraordinary debt at the end of their, their four year or six year Time at Mizzou, we're all we're all working to avoid that, right? Um, but we have students who who have financial resources available to them that they don't access because they they're concerned about um, how much debt they're going to have, or or some folks just averse to having a loan associated with with their their cost of of education. Um, we, we think that um, providing our students and their families with, with much earlier understanding of the financial requirement that they have to, to, success and to successfully um, and financially successfully complete at Mizzou is going to be very, very important. Um, you know, our, our Redu reduction in cost of educational materials. That was one of the earliest um, priorities that Dr. Choi initiated when he got here as president. Um, and, and we have dramatically caught, cut, cut the cost. I think, in fact, Curator Chapman was there at the uh, announcement at the bookstore that day, Daryl. Uh, oh, Curator Chapman, I'm sorry, didn't mean to take that liberty there with you. Um, and, and so we've had a dramatic reduction in that. This plateau tuition where students now can take our 15 or 16 or 17 at no additional cost and can be a significant game changer. We've seen that at other institutions. Um, and, and so there, again, a number of things that factor into this financial balance. I don't know if I've 
adequately responded to your question, Jeff, or not, but um, um, we're, we're, we're really trying to work on controlling cost and, and also providing students with access to the financial resources that they need. Thank you. It's a very good answer. And, and that's really what I'm, you know, sensitive to the delicate balance of, hey, we're the top university in the state. We offer a tremendous education. However, we, we do have to be very sensitive, I think, to cost. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My pleasure. I can personally attest to the value that Dr. Spain added to my career 28 years ago when I met him. So um, thanks again, Dr. Spain. <laughs> I, I would comment that getting the kids out of there in less time is going to do more for your value side of it and the cost side. Um, uh, I think the last chart I saw, tuition was maybe what? 40%, 35% of the cost per year to go to school. And that doesn't even take into consideration the economic loss of having to give up another semester uh, or six months or three months uh, to finish your degree. So uh, the sooner we can get these kids out and they take the 15, I, I like the tracking the hours, credit hours are completing. I, I think that's fabulous to get them out on time. Uh, we'll, we'll give them a better value because it's going to cost them letter, cost them less to get their degree. And, and, and curator, that, that's one of the reasons we're so pleased with the change in our four-year graduation rate. And we've gone from 44 to 56 percent, and 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 that's a that's a dramatic impact. Not only do they decrease their cost, but they start <laughs> to um, earn earn a real salary much sooner in, in response to that as well. So we, we appreciate that important point very much. I have a, a comment I can add. And the questions that Curator Lehman and Curator Holbrock asked are so relevant to this discussion. And many in many situations, we typically focus on the, the sticker price of the tuition. But as you know, there's always discounting that occurs through scholarships and other grants. But it's also important to recognize that, that students that graduate earlier because they have access to more class sections, they have access to more advisors and faculty members that would, that would actually help them navigate through the educational uh, endeavor are gonna have lower debt. And so just as an example, you know, we always use uh, University of Illinois as a, as, a, as a university that is doing many things well in terms of student success. Their graduation rate over six years is about 85%. Our graduation rate here at Mizzou is 73% and you, you've seen the other universities. Well, they actually graduate their students earlier. So the actual average indebtedness, even though tuition at Illinois is 21,000, our tuition is about 15,000, average indebtedness at Illinois is lower than Mizzou because students do graduate earlier. And I just wanna share this slide because I think it does illustrate uh, some important points. Um, Can you see that slide, Curator Chapman? Okay. This shows from 2003 to 2022 for the University of Illinois up on the uh, top and University of Missouri. In terms of the rank among public, public universities when it comes to financial resources that are provided for education. Our financial resources come from tuition and state support primarily. And when state support went down and we also had Senate Bill 397 that limited our ability to increase tuition, we had been sliding the wrong way, even though back in 2003, we were competitive in, in a rank with Illinois. If you look at where we are in terms of four-year graduation rate, and we reported 50% graduation rate in 2022 at Mizzou, 
which is a significant increase from about 36% in 2003. But look at Illinois. When we look at the fat student to faculty ratios, the staff that are available for advising, all of these resources, investments are made because of, of higher per capita support from the state, in addition, higher tuition. The fact that they graduate students with less debt means that they're applying their financial aid to students that need that support to graduate. And that's an important factor. And while I'm showing this slide for Mizzou, it's, uh, the trends are not any different for than the other three universities. Thank you, Dr. I, uh, I have a question about when whole, when you look at the financial hold that you put on, uh, that you have on the students that uh, are past due, what are the, what are the reasons that they're past due? Is it like parking fees? Is the, so the book fees? I mean, have you, have you drilled down into that and see, is there any trends in there that you could address? Uh, that's a great question, and and we have um, made some changes at Mizzou. Uh, at 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 one point, you could go to the Mizzou store and charge anything that Mizzou store had an in inventory to your student account. So for ex we had an example of a student who charged an Xbox 360 to his account. And that was the only thing that was on his past due ledger. So, and, and Dr. Choi um, acknowledged um, Gary Ward, who's retiring. Um, Gary helped lead an initiative that restructured the student charging um, what students could charge and what students could not charge to, to eliminate that. And yes, we, we, we have the, the situation where we have students who accumulate parking fees, um, but now students can um, work those or pay those parking fees off with food donations that then we, we use for our, our Tiger um, food pantry. Um, what we're finding, um, Curator, is that in many cases, uh, and, and Emily Hainham would be the, the best person to describe the complexities of this um, as Director of Financial Aid here at Mizzou, but in many cases, our financial aid resources are helping cover um, the cost of tuition, um, cost of books, um, but where the students are falling short in many cases is their housing and um, meal plans. And, and so um, that's again to, to Curator um, Hobrock's point and to Dr. Choi's point, if we graduate them earlier, we graduate them um, with less of those overall expenses that they've incurred and are, are held responsible. Um, and, and it's not uncommon for for us to, um, to be able to work with a student who has a past due balance of five or $6,000 and, and identify the financial resources that allow them to clear that account and retain them here on campus. Um, but then um, some students accumulate debt that is harder for us to be able to help them resolve so that they can continue. Hope that hey, answered your was. question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that, sir. I just, uh, I would, it's curious to know what, what, what parts of their financial picture are, is, uh, are causing them issues. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, and that's one of the reasons this, our new Office of Financial Success is going to be so important so that, that students and their families can gain a better understanding of, of the, the expense ledger that they, they have control over and, um, and how to, to financially work 
the, the have a financial wellness plan so that they can complete. And, and Provost Ramshan um, deserves a great deal of credit for being such a strong advocate for that office and, and, and centralizing it um, with central funding and connecting it with financial aid so we can connect the, the financial aid office with the financial counseling aspect. Could I uh, jump in and have a comment here, Molly Agarwal, UKC. I agree with everything that's been said. The sooner the students can graduate, uh, the more earning power they have. But Students are also different, and I think some of the students we have in urban areas actually have to work their way through college. Uh, sometimes they are actually supporting their families right out of high school. And so even if we gave them the best advising and everything, they still just have time limitations uh, to do that. So I, I just want to make sure that we don't put all the students in one category. Uh, I think this may be more of an issue for UMSL students and for UMKC students who are looking at the urban student population. Uh, I was surprised and I don't have the numbers up front, but two or three years ago, I had uh, us look at how many students through a survey were actually working their way through school. And there was a significant number that were actually working 40 hour weeks and coming to school. So uh, it, it's a very complex problem. Uh, I agree with all the levers that we're talking about. Those do help, but then there will still be a significant number of students who face difficulties. And I think the only way we can help them is through major financial help, um, and that's scholarshiping. And we've also really stepped up the resources we're providing to families and parents at the at the front end to talk about that value proposition of higher education, number one, and and just basics of how to talk to your students about money. And um, again, the the one on one appointments with financial aid that are happening really early on when students get here, I think are instrumental in helping them understand the costs, the hidden costs, what some of the, um, so just so that planning and um, thoughtfulness can be put in at the front end. Absolutely, this is Kristen Sobel at UMSL, and I wanted to follow up with what um, Chancellor Agarwal was saying. 75, as um, Beth Echelkamp has indicated, 75% of our students are transfer students, and they're not necessarily the traditional student. And so we have um, older adult learners that are coming back, they have families, they have situations. And of course, our job, and we've been doing a good job of decreasing the time to graduation and decreasing their debt, but it, it is a full court press and it involves a lot of different programs um, feeding into the success of that particular student because students aren't all um, the same. So I, I, I value this conversation a lot and uh, appreciate the comments that people have made. Thank you. And uh, for us, we are faced with an entirely different situation where a great many of our students take the path of co-op as well as the uh, internship uh, with different companies. They take two, three semesters off to go do co-op. And of course, that's what enhances their opportunity for getting recruited with uh, you know, large companies. So uh, there is, there is uh, clearly carefulness that needs to be paid attention to when we come up with one policy that doesn't cover really doesn't fit all the students. Uh, nonetheless, uh, every recommendation that has been made, hopefully will make an impact. Okay. Molly, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said, and, and Christian, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. And here was my surprise. All the universities picked six-year and four-year graduation rates. And I was astounded by that. I was literally astounded by that. I would have thought that UMSLs would have been entirely different. And, 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 and the same thing with s and uh, But yet you guys all focus on the same thing that you got to elect yourself. So it's not one policy. Each university was asked to write their own path. Hmm. Well, but you know, uh, if I may, uh, Curator Hobrock, there is, there is a national standard that universities are measured by, four-year graduation, six-year graduation rate, and all of that. 
But then there are other factors. Uh, you know, the, 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 the level of uh, job offers they get, the starting salaries they get, the return on investment they get. Given that there is a common benchmarking that happens, uh, you know, whether we choose it or not, four-year graduation, six-year graduation, uh, it behooves us to look at those uh, statistics, but not lose sight of all these other important uh, parameters as well. So we were, we, we, we surely put in for four-year graduation, six-year graduation, because that's a measurable metric and is nationally reviewed, you know, for ranking organizations, uh, return on investment organizations and all of that. But we should not take all of those in isolation from all the other important parameters. I would uh, second that, uh, you know, all our rankings, US News and World Report, everybody ranks us by those metrics. And that's why Curator Hoberak, one of the other things I've started tracking here, although it's never tracked anywhere else, is the graduation index that how many degrees are we actually putting out? every year. Because at the end of the day, if you're contributing to the workforce, how many degrees are we putting out compared to what in a perfect world would be 25% of your students graduating every year? So what happens in between is complex because some of the people come in as first time to college, drop out, others come in, sit out for two semesters, and now they fall through the cracks because they need a transfer is now first time to college. Uh, and, and then the transfer students. So it's so complex and co continuously moving. So I think it is important for us to figure out how many degrees we put out into the workforce uh, compared to how many people are enrolled at institutions. Because it gives us some semblance of are we being effective in creating the workforce that we are here to do. Uh, but uh, it, it's a different story when you have uh, a high school kid who graduates, and especially in some communities, especially in minority communities, uh, they have to go back and support their families. And we talked about the socioeconomic pieces, uh, Chairman Chapman brought that up. That's very true. Some of them cannot even, on top of paying for school, they have to earn more to support their family. So how do we take all of that into account and get them to, through? To a degree quickly is the challenge. Uh, I get it. And I'm not making this as, a, as an excuse. We have to continuously pull all the levels, but just bringing up the complexities here. Most of the students that graduate from universities will graduate if they graduate within six years. We're not going to have many that take seven or eight years. So with the graduation rates that we have, those students that graduate in three years, four years, five years, and six years, we can calculate the average time to graduation. So that is a, a measurable. Uh, many universities don't keep track of that, so we can't compare. It's not readily available, but we can develop that uh, metric for all four universities. And I think we all agree, despite the different demographics of students that we have, we can get students to graduate in four years, a high percentage. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Definitely. less time at school, less time uh, paying tuition and living expenses, and that they'll be contributing uh, in the workforce after they graduate. Yeah. One you of know, the things that we haven't really talked about yet um, here as much is, is that so a little bit on the social mobility ranking, but... Um, for example, the range of uh, fam average family income of our students across the system ranges from about $34,000 a year, like at UMSL, to $119,000 a year. And then the social mobility is when they graduate. One thing that I know I've seen s and do quite well is take a look at the average um, you know, salary at graduation. And that's one parameter. Another is, for example, at UMSL, our average family income start, they start at $34,000 a year, but when they graduate, our students are graduating at $54,000 a year. That's that social mobility ranking um, and moving uh, people up to the next level. So there's a lot of things to look at. And I think what's important is that student success is frankly the center of what, why we're all here and making sure that given our student demographics that we are doing a good job and 
and was pleased for me to see that all of the universities are really focused on this and that they are improving their rankings and they have specific ways to continue that. And I, I you know, and I think that's a very good point uh, that uh, Kristen raises. Uh, national ranking organizations are also divided in the sense of what is their objective. For example, you know, at s and our tuition is so low compared to their first year starting salary, the first year starting salary of our graduates, that their debt after their graduate is about one third of their first year salary. As a result, when you look at the national surveying of methods and organizations that rank universities, when it comes to ROI, s and is consistently in top 10, univer 10, 10 uh, universities in the country. So uh, there are ranking, there are methodologies that are different from one another. Uh, like President Choi mentioned, a uh, great majority of our students graduate under four and a half years, despite the fact that they go to co-op and internships and all of that. And, we actually, I mean, I don't know if Kathy has that data available, but we looked at how many, in fact, we have students that graduate in three and a half years, then four years and four and a half years. All of that data is available, but the reason we, uh, you know, we presented four years and six years is because it's the national really benchmarking, uh, frankly, whether it's a good one or not, but that's what it is. Let me give you the data on that just really, really quickly. Our four-year graduation rate up until recently has only been 24%, but our mean time to graduation is four and a half years. So you can see how you need to have a, a broader context with more data points to really get a picture of what's happening. Thanks for letting me add that. Yeah, okay, we're running a little short on time. Um, so, so if we could wrap it up, is it, does anyone have any further final comments or questions about this presentation? I just wanted to throw in um, from our student success conversation last year, I'm really impressed that so many of you were able to implement some of the ideas you shared. Um, and I thought that was shown in the metrics. And um, I don't remember us talking about it last year, but I thought it's interesting that you have moved beyond financial aid to really talking about financial wellness and financial counseling, which I think is obviously an opportunity and we can't take for granted that that kind of education is happening anymore before they get to the university. So um, I appreciate that and saw that consistently through the program. Okay, any further comments? Okay, well, I wanna thank all the presenters today um, for their efforts to improve student success across all the universities. Thank you so much. And we really appreciated the discussion and conversation. Dr. Spain, oh, yes, thanks everyone. All right. Okay, so moving on to the good and welfare of the board. Um, so Steve, I hope you're ready to give a, give a little bit of a presentation or talk after this. Um, the board would now, would now like to recognize General Counsel Steve Owens, who will be retiring March 1st for his service to the university. Personally, Steve has been a mentor of mine while serving on the board. He is a friend and he's also a very good lawyer. Steve also started a program in the Office of General Counsel where new and or diverse attorneys are provided with opportunities to gain legal experience. I'm very proud to call Steve a friend and to have had the opportunity to work with him over the last five years. It is my honor to recognize you, Steve, for your service to the board and the university with the resolution. I wanna read a couple of statements from the resolution for everyone joining us today. And I quote, Steve has served with distinction since January, 2008. He is the only person to serve as general counsel, interim president and interim chancellor during his tenure. While serving as interim president, Steve presided over a, a momentous year in university history with MU Athletics moving from the Big 12 to the SEC, the overhaul of the retirement program, the sale of RADL and launching a search for a new Missouri s and chancellor. Steve provided reliable advice, is a great listener, a trusted confidant and a valuable soundboard for the board and his colleagues. He assembled a great team of attorneys and his office was featured in Modern Council for the development of a quality legal team serving higher education. 
May I now have a motion and a second from the board to approve the resolution in your materials, recognizing the dedicated service of General Counsel Steve Owens. I'm honored to so move. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Those that say nay? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Steve, for your service. Steve, could you please say a few words to everyone um, as you approach your retirement here on March 1st? We're gonna miss you. Uh, please say a few words, thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Chapman. Thank you for those very kind words and thanks to members of the board for the resolution and the designation as General Counsel Emeritus. I mean, who would have thunk it, right? So, um, but I do wanna take this opportunity to say that it's been the honor of my professional life to serve the university as general counsel, interim president and interim chancellor. I think as most of you know, this university is my alma mater. It's the alma mater of four generations of my family, four generations of my wife's family and countless Missourians. And when I arrived here in 2008, I told a reporter that I accepted the job because after faith, education is the great equalizer in the world and the opportunity to work in higher education in general and at my alma mater in particular was too great an opportunity to pass up. And now after 14 years, I still feel the same way. What we do here matters and what you all do here matters. And there's probably no greater example than my family. I mentioned uh, four generations of my family attended the university. I was the third generation. My grandfather, Claude, got his engineering degree here and used it to become one of the early leaders in the Missouri Highway Department. And Claude passed along his engineering training and his remarkable zest for precision to his son, my dad, Jim. And my dad had his college education interrupted to serve in World War II, like many of his generation. But he returned to the university and got what was then a rare combination of degrees available at the university, a combination of both engineering and business. And it was the perfect combination to go to work for what was then a fledgling punch card company known as IBM, where he spent his entire career. My mother Peggy was, as she described herself, an army brat. She lived all over the country as a child, except in Missouri. But when she graduated from high school at the age of 16, she got on a train by herself and traveled across the country to Missouri so she could attend its renowned School of Journalism. She was attracted to the University of Missouri and the School of Journalism because of their reputation for excellence. And Peggy passed along to her children, her love of writing and her passion for composition. I can remember many occasions, many a session around the breakfast room table where she took us through the paragraph form. Those sessions were intense and I much, much more enjoyed watching my siblings go through it than myself. But each member of my family has benefited tremendously from the university, especially its faculty. And each generation of my family and countless families throughout Missouri have benefited from the previous generations which preserved the university's core values and tried to improve on its mission under changing circumstances and in, in a dynamic environment. We stand on the shoulders of our predecessors and the jewel that must be preserved and passed on. So what you do here matters now and in the future. During my time here, I've tried to make a point of expressing my appreciation to the many people who make up the university family. And I will get more opportunities to do that between March, uh, March 1 and now. But for today, let me focus on the board and its direct reports. To members of the board, past and present, thank you. Thank you for devoting so much time and effort to the university, free of charge, I might add. And thank you for applying that time and effort with such passion. To President Choi, your boundless energy and your culture-changing focus are making my university better. 
Thank you for being such a consequential leader and such a valued colleague. And to Cindy Harmon, thank you for the way you do your job, making us all better. And thank you for being the person that you are. On March 1, I'll leave behind many great friends and wonderful colleagues, especially those in the Office of the General Counsel. Working together, the Office of General Counsel lawyers and staff members focus on serving the client, producing quality work product, and being good citizens and colleagues. They have established a culture that expects excellence, and they push one another towards it. Simply stated, the members of the OGC are my greatest contribution to the university. The many successes over the years are theirs. The rare failures are mine. Thank you to them. In closing, thanks to the members of the board and your predecessors for giving me opportunities to serve my family's universities in such meaningful ways. It has been my honor and my privilege. Thank you, Steve. Very good. Excellent. All right. Well, the, Steve, the, the virtual the virtual resolution is still good, right? I mean, it's, not, it's still good. Just, yeah, that's right. It's good. good. Well, Steve, you will be missed, and thank you so much for your service. Um, we really, really appreciate you. We're going to miss you. Anyone else have any comments for Steve? All right, I'm sure people will be, oh, go ahead. I'll just like to say this. Uh, my first intense meeting uh, as a curator uh, was the orientation uh, that Steve gave to me up in Columbia and his love for the University of Missouri and his historical background that he gave, that he gave me was excellent. I'll always remember it and I appreciate it so much because his love for the university comes through all the way. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It does. It really does. I'd like to just say something really quickly and it'll be very brief. I just want to say thank you for all that you have given of yourself personally. I know that you've had to travel to Columbia with your family living uh, several hours away. That's a big sacrifice. Thank you for your patience. I mean, Steve has been insanely patient. I think all of us have driven him absolutely insane and you can't even get a reaction from him. He doesn't even ever get frustrated. So I, I, I hope that um, you are getting to enjoy your best years with your family and getting to watch this from afar. Um, but I'm sure you'll have a lot of phone calls in, in between. And uh, if you're ever in St. Louis, please look me up. Or if you're in Naples, please look me up. I'd love to see you, take you out for dinner and uh, have a glass of wine. So thank you and cheers to you. Thank you. Steve, I think everyone uh, knows how I feel about you. And uh, all, of us, all of us as we go through life, as we end one segment of our career, we want to feel like we've made a difference and no one, can say that any louder or with more pride than you. You have made such a difference in the boards that have served with you, with the university, the university leadership, and in the entire state of Missouri. And so I know I speak for so many people, including thousands and thousands of Missourians, when I say thank you for making such a tremendous difference and higher education in our great state. Thank you. Thank you all. Just, all right. Anyone else? Just one last comment, Curator Chapman, and yes. that is, there will be a special celebration on February 22nd at three o'clock at the Collins Club at Foro Field for Steve. Uh, please do join us. This will be uh, hosted by the Board of Curators and uh, my office. And Steve, you made this university a better university, and we knew that we know. I know that took a lot of hard work and courage. So thank you, thank you for your many contributions. All right, thank you, Steve. All right, are there any other items for the good and welfare of the board? 
Okay, hearing none, I would entertain a motion and a second from the board to go into executive session. I so move. Second. All right, Cindy, please call the roll. Curator Burnsick. Yes. Curator Chapman. Yes. Curator Graham. Yes. Curator Graves. Yes. Curator Holbrock. Yes. Curator Holloway. Curator Holloway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Curator Layman. Yes. Curator Winokur. Yes. Curator Williams. Yes. All right. All votes in favor. Okay, that concludes the public portion of the board meeting today. The board thanks everyone for their reports and discussion. Um, everyone stay safe out there. President Choi and I will be available um, during the press conference in a few minutes. Um, the board will convene executive session, let's just say in 15 minutes. So at five after, five after two, um, we can convene executive session. Um, and as a reminder, there's a separate Zoom link for executive session, okay? Um, at five after two, we will meet in executive session. All right, thanks everyone.